Welcome back, everybody. Uh, new video. Uh, this one's going to be called Mysteries Mysteries of Cold Dogs. And it stems from a post I had in my group uh, concerning cold dogs. And uh, also uh, from Hunter Man. He suggested I make this video, you know. And uh, again, you know, nothing current, nothing meant for illegal purposes i'm not teaching anybody anything i'm talking about the past this is all historical and educational uh that's always the case sometimes i don't put a disclaimer sometimes i do but the disclaimer is across the board every video i do and even in other chats or whatever my group all that same disclaimer so the idea of of cold dogs you know or or uh, what people think of them why do they breed them uh you know always comes up and i've done videos on before and other people's chats and in, in posts on my group and other groups like that anybody that knows me knows i didn't keep or breed cold dogs or cur dogs that doesn't mean that all my dogs were dead game this and that all that bs not that it's just that that uh if a dog one of my dogs quit i didn't keep it or breed it and uh you know some of them proved to be deep game, a couple dead game, right? And it's not that I wanted them to prove to be dead game because a dead game dog to me is, is worthless as far as breeding it. Uh, I wish those dogs had survived. I might have bred them and they almost surely would have produced good dogs for me. It's something that happens. I don't wish that on anybody or any dog. A lot of my dogs prove their gameness. And so when we speak of cold dogs, you know, what is a cold dog? Some people have a misconception of what it is. They're misconstruing what they saw in front of them as being a cold dog. And what I mean by that is they'll see dogs that, that quit. They don't want to fight. They react badly, negatively to the pain or what's going on or the aggression from their opponent. They run away and cry and jump out and all that stuff. That's not the behavior of a cold dog. Cold dog is indifferent to what's in front of them. They're indifferent to the challenge. They don't react negatively when something grabs them or throws them around. It's almost like they're dumbfounded. They don't cry and whine. They just stand there kind of looking at them like, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know. They basically don't react like you think someone would react. It'd be like if somebody punched you in the face and you just look back at them like, you know, what's going on? Why are you doing that? Kind of that way. That's basically what a cold dog is. So to, to, uh, to some people, they don't understand what the difference is. Now, I don't try and psychoanalyze dogs, you know, they're cold because of this and they're cold because of that. I don't know. And there's no science. There's no test done. There's no genetic marker. There's none of that to say this is why a dog is cold. This is what's going through their mind. This is where it comes from and their genetic makeup, these alleles, all that stuff. There's none of that. So it's basically the experience of the person or the people that have had them, been around them, raised them, all that. It may be an educated opinion, but it's their opinion. There's no science to back it up. And if there is, maybe I'm wrong. If there is, let me see it. Uh, there's very little done on pit dogs. It's all from the community. It's all from history. It's all from the past. It's all from experience. Dogmen of the past and present. And it will be in the future. We're the scientists in that respect. We give our opinion based on our experiences, what we see, breedings, cold dogs, cur dogs, all that. We, For me, it was important to see what was in front of me. I could say, that's a cold dog. That dog quit. That dog was game. That dog was rough. That dog was a hard biter. That dog had good air. Right? The physical stuff, there's a lot of science on that. But in their head, not too much. It's just what we what we observe 
and the results we get from that observance what the dog shows us but anybody like i said that knows me knows i didn't i didn't keep those dogs i didn't want them and i have a reason for that because to me it's a negative trait i don't want that in my bloodline i'm gonna have to deal with it later or current or whatever and in all my breedings i didn't produce a cold dog my friend who got my blood and continued with it in all those years never got a cold dog from my stuff so that could be a result of not keeping not breeding cold dogs right it's not the end all be all it doesn't mean you're going to have great dogs but it's just a negative that I didn't have to deal with. And I could concentrate on the good ones and determine which ones based on their structure and their temperament and behavior and performance and athleticism. All that I could see and I could make decisions on which ones I wanted to keep and which ones I wanted to breed. Based on their performance. Whether they were matched or whether they were good enough to be matched and held back for breeding. Whatever it is, I saw right in front of me what the dog could do. And as you build your pedigrees, as you build your family of dogs going forward, that's what I wanted to see. I could choose each dog going back. This dog did that. This dog did this. This type of behavior. This type of mother. Uh, you know, this influence. This All this information that I kept notes on on each individual dog that I bred and competed with. So... You know, that that was my reasons for not doing it. But other people had reasons for doing it. Right? And some people don't have very good reason. Most people that I talk to, there's two types. One is mostly what people say. And it's, I like the pedigree. I'm breeding based on the bloodlines. Others will give me more information, more examples. And, uh, you know, I'll get into that a little bit later. But let me use Gamefile as an example. And I'll use one of the most famous guys from the past named Frank Shy. Right? Most people know you don't fight hens. You only fight the cocks, the males. Right? So how, what did he do? How did he choose which hens he's going to? free to first and foremost it was their structure wings breasts legs head all that eyes all all kinds of stuff and their behavior and their temperament he liked outgoing females he liked females you know hens that were energetic and high spirited fast had good balance the way they walked all this stuff but the other standard that he had, and he stuck to it religiously, was if he was going to breed a hen, her brothers had to be ace cocks in the pit. Her sire had to be an ace cock in the pit. Most of the time, multiple winners. If they didn't have that, he would not breed them. So when it comes to breeding cold dogs, you have to have some kind of standards. Naylor in the group gave some of his great go back and look at it read his comments made sense to me right so uh let me let me give you another example here i have tutor's flow is a widely known female she's the dam of jimmy boots very famous dog reportedly she was cold so jimmy boots of course he's the one who beat benny bob benny bob was the one who beat his sire bully son Jimmy Boots was a devastating dog, had all the tools, and he was game. Jimmy Boots is sired by Kennedy's Booger Red. Booger Red was a two-time winner. He lost a famous match dead game to Hooten's Butcher Boy. Right? Jimmy Boots, of course, is out of Usselton's flow. Booger Red is by Howard's Tobe, out of Howard's Rose. Heavy uh, Dibo stuff right uh related to grand champion hank and champion jesse and their brother smith a lot of dogs with this blood in it back in the day little boots comes from that stuff you know wilkerson and powell's little boots so a lot of performance in there 
Also, Tim Flow was by Tudor's Lucky, Tudor's Baby, right? Again, uh, Lucky is Heinzel's Musty and Heinzel's Little Polly. So you see some Kobe blood in there through Musty going back to Dime, Kobe's Dime. And then uh, Little Polly and then Tudor's uh, Baby Siren Dam were uh, Tudor's Tony and or Tony, whatever it is, it might be a misspelling, and Tudor's Polly. So it's a lot of, a lot of Dibo, I would call it heavy line bread Dibo with some outcrosses in there. There's some Williams blood in there, you know, but you have uh, Tudor's Red Bill, Tudor Sandy, Sandry, you got Tudor Spike and Black Widow, very famous uh, breeding, you know, there's bloodlines named after that. Spike Black Widow, Zeke Black Widow, Dibo Black Widow, you know, Black v Widow, very prominent female back in the day. Uh, you have Heinzel's Clancy, another son of Daibo in there. Five-time winner, one-time loser. Clancy had the distinction of losing to to uh, the Siwash dog. Uh, and then in a rematch, he beat him. Uh, again, more Tudor Spike and Black Widow down at the bottom. So it's heavy, heavy Daibo. And uh, uh, with some outcrosses in there of Colby and Williams Blood. Stuff like that. But the main thing concerning flow is there's performance and production behind her. Now, as far as her structure, I only seen pictures. I don't know her temperament. I don't know her behavior. I don't know if she was a good mother. But just based on her pedigree, what we're seeing here is performance dogs. Dogs that were actually pitted. Dogs that were winners. Some of them losers. But they made the box. And the dogs behind them were great producers. Dogs behind her were great producers. Some of them had bloodlines named after them. Right? So Jimmy Boots is the result of all this, even though his mother was cold. He's a result of coming from match dogs and producers of match dogs. Multiple ones. All throughout his pedigree. So I can see why... Usselton's flow was bred. Jim Usselton, Texas Dogman, one of the protégés of Earl Tudor, right? Successful Dogman. Had a lot of great dogs. O'Brien, and you see a bunch of them in there. You just have to do some research, and you can research all this. Look at their siblings. Look at their offspring. Most of them competed with. Most of them uh, come from great producers, you know? I don't even know if there's other cold dogs in, in the background or whatever. But the point is that although Flo was a cold dog, why did they breed her? Because of that. Look how she's bred. Not just the pedigree, which is what a lot of people use an excuse for breeding a cold dog. Not just the pedigree. The dogs in the pedigree. Who are her parents? Who are her grandparents? Great grandparents going back farther and farther. That's why a dog, cold female like Flo, could produce a great dog like Jimmy Boots. It's not by accident. It's not because, you know, uh, you know, it's this blood crossed with that blood. You know, Boomerang. It's not Red Boy Jocko. You know, Jeep and all that stuff. Not, it's not that. This was dog for dog. These are great dogs producers. So when we speak about you know, cold dogs. What are they? To me, they're a catalyst. There's something to be used to get to the next point. There's something that is a vessel, especially females, to produce pups, right? So you, you as, as far as structure and behavior and all that, temperament, that's right in front of you. You could see that cold dog, but you don't know anything about the performance. You can't base it on anything you see. That's why I said it's important for me to see the performance of my dogs firsthand. Each and every one of them. You can't do that with a cold dog. So you're not basing your breedings off of performance, her performance, but you are basing them off of the performance of what's behind her. So you're breeding that dog based on what's behind them. That's where I see the effectiveness of it. Just like Flo. Filled with winners, filled with 
champions, producers, all that. That's where it becomes important. And if you don't have that to back up your cold dog, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't advise breeding it, you know. The same thing with uh, Hammond's Rufus. He's an inbred dog. Reportedly, he was a cold dog. Who's his sire? Champion. Uh, um, darn it, I just had it. Alligator. Hammond said the alligator was an ace dog in his day. Any dog handled and conditioned by Don Mayfield and Danny Burton had to be a pretty damn good dog. There's no doubt he was a great dog. There's no doubt with his heavy influence of Daibo and, and Carver that there were match dogs behind him and producers behind him. Not only that, his siblings were matched in one also. His sister, brothers, like that. So there's a standard behind Rufus if he was cold, like what's been reported, why they would breed him, why they would use him. He's an ROM sire, produced a lot of great dogs. People based whole families of dogs on him, on alligator. And, uh, you know, I saw a very good son of, of Rufus back in the day, Anderson's champion Brutus. Top dog, great shape. So I know at least one dog firsthand what he could produce. I was impressed. So those are the things I would suggest you do if you're going to have if you're going to breed cold dogs, have a reason for doing it. Have something to back up that cold dog. Because what inevitably happens, and this has happened over and over again throughout my career in the past, is, and not just with cold dogs, but dogs that quit, is, uh, you know, they'll tell me, you know, it's the only dog I have. And, you know, I want to keep this blood going and this and that. and Or I'm starting out. This is all I got. And I'm barely starting out. You know, and I want to breed it. My suggestion is we'll breed it. That's your reason for doing it. Do it. The other thing they say is, well, you know, this dog's cold or this dog quit. Look at Usselton's flow. She was cold. Okay, don't compare your dog to Usselton's flow. There's no performance behind it. There's no breeding behind it. There's no winners behind it. There's no production behind it. You can't make that comparison. Same thing when I've seen dogs quit, rank, two or three minutes, jump this and that, and the people want to take them home. What are you going to do? I'm going to breed it. Why? Well, look at the, this dog and that dog. He quit. That dog quit. He produced great dogs and this and that. And if you do your research, most of them dogs that quit, famous dogs that were great producers, they went through hell before they hit that box, while they were in that box, and after they got out of that box. They weren't rank five-minute quitters. They weren't dogs that basically jumped the pit, screaming and crying. The dog came in sometimes in poor condition. Sometimes they were old. Sometimes they were played out. Multiple winners, and they just kept doing them till they quit. Finally, they gave up. Or the dog took heavy, heavy damage. Well over an hour, they finally quit. Not the same as what I'm looking at here. This dog that obviously is not up to par. You know, I know one ROM dog that was treated cruelly when he lost. The fight should have been stopped way before it was. Went well past the hour and a half mark. Luckily, the dog survived. Luckily, uh, he was bred and produced some great dogs. Going through that heavy trauma... That's not the same as what we're looking at. And the same when it comes to a cold dog. There's nothing... You want You want to keep this cold dog and breed it based on what? Yeah, she's a vessel or he's a vessel. But there's nothing behind them. There wasn't any winners in three, four, five generations behind them. No production. No examples of performance. No physical traits that you can track. You don't know anything about them. You're just basing it on because it's a Jeep dog or it's a Red Boy Jocko dog or it's a Boomerang dog or it's bred this way and that way. Nothing to back it up. So that would be the difference. Have some good reasons for using that cold dog. Is it based on the structure? That's a good thing. Temperament, behavior? That's a good thing. 
maybe athleticism that you don't see like we did in the past. But you enter them in competitions or you do this or that, you know, with them. Treadmill race, wall climb, something that gives you a reason to breed that dog. And here's another thing I want to mention, talking to Hunter, man. He mentioned a, a, a female they had that they bred. She was cold. She threw good dogs, you know. Uh, I said, great. And she had that standard. She was off a champion, this and that, production, all that. So I asked him, you know, uh, did she throw any cold dogs after, you know, she was cold, but did she throw cold dogs? He said, no. I said, well, if she had, what would you have done? Well, we wouldn't have bred them. Okay. That made sense to me. The point of that is don't repeat it over and over. Because I know a couple of families of dogs throughout the years had cold dogs in them. They would continue to breed cold dogs. So... They got some great dogs, some badass dogs, killers. But they consistently got cold dogs too. You try and eliminate the next, you know, all the negative stuff that you can. As much of it as you can. You can't get rid of it. But if you keep using those types of dogs, you're going to compound the situation. Like Danny Burton told me one time, he had a female was cold, he bred her. All the males in the litter were match-worthy dogs and they were matched. All the females in the litter were cold. Well, if you keep breeding, though, you're going to get a bunch of cold dogs. Eventually, it's going to compound itself. So I understand breeding a cold dog. Try not to repeat it too often or at all after that. And like I said, sometimes, guys, that's all they got. Well, breed it and see. See what you get. But if you keep breeding cold dog after that, in your mind thinking, well, that, that female was cold. She threw great dogs. I'm going to breed this other one that's cold. You know, that's not the way to do it. And the reason I say that is because throughout the history of breed, most of the dogs that were bred weren't cold. And most of the dogs came from competition dogs. Whether anybody wants to acknowledge that or not. You know, I always say, don't make the exception the standard. Don't start breeding a bunch of cold dogs because you think you're going to get great dogs like Usselton's Flow Through or something like that. And you might, but you're also going to get a bunch of cold dogs. Defeats the purpose of having the dogs. Unless, you know, you, you can you can uh, utilize them in confirmation show, this or that. I'm not, I, I never tell anybody what to do. I'm speaking from my own experiences. If you want to breed cold dogs, that's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm just trying to explain to you and, and make you understand that if you compound negatives, you're going to get negatives. That's why they used to say, you know, uh, when you inbreed dogs, you double the good stuff and you triple the bad stuff. Kind of like that, you know. So if you continue to breeding cold dogs, uh, you're probably going to get more of them. Or if you utilize a cold dog like Usselton's Flow or like Hammond's Rufus, right? And then you don't repeat that process later on because you're getting good dogs out of them. Use a good one. Use the competitive ones or the athletic ones. You know, uh, it doesn't mean the cold dogs just lay around and don't do nothing. It's just that they don't have that instinct in the past. And the point is, and I'm not suggesting that anybody do anything illegal. But what I am suggesting is have a reason for breeding it. Not just because it's a Jeep dog. Not just because it's a Mayday dog or Eli dog or whatever. Have some production and athleticism behind it. While you do it. And once you get enough dogs. There's no reason for you to keep using those type of dogs. Unless through some. You know. Through through your own trials and errors. If that cold dog from your line of dogs. Or cold dogs in general from your line of dogs. Have proved to produce excellent dogs. Then. That's what your methods prove. In that respect, I would say, well, use them. You know when to use them. You know how to use them. You know which ones are going to produce. Utilize them. So, you know, this is a little bit came came through all, you know, a lot of times it's through chats that I'm in or it's through posts. And uh, like I said, Hunter Man suggested I do this. Again, this is based on opinion. 
of what I've seen and the history I've researched and, uh, you know, what I've uh, seen with my own two eyes on other people's yards or what I know through the history of the breed. And I just used Usselton's Flow and Hammond's Rufus as examples because they were great producers. But there's a reason they were, even though they were cold. So again, let me know what you think. And uh, thanks for all the support.